Thank you, Colton, for leading us in musical worship this morning. I think that might be your first time leading us on the Lord's Day morning. Grateful for your leadership there, dear brother, and the rest of our team as they, they led us. I don't know if you detected it, but I, I sensed a little bit of doubt in Rob this morning of whether we would go through all of 6 through 10. Perhaps I was just a little self-conscious, but I, I sensed some doubt. So we should get started this morning. This is a wonderful, wonderful chapter that we've been in. And the more I think about this church in Thessalonica, what, what a blessing it would have been to be in this congregation. Can you imagine all the rich things that we're learning about this congregation here? And we think about the, really the explosive work of the gospel in their life and how powerful that is and what it must have been like to be there. And Paul is reminiscing on what God did when he was first among them and showing it to us so that we might think about what vibrant Christianity should look like within our own congregation. And that we want to, to really think on carefully. So we've been making our way through this very first chapter of the book as we're studying the whole of it, and we will be studying this book throughout the rest of this year together uh, and just digging through its great truths. We, we were reminded just a few weeks ago of how Paul normally begins most of his letters with a statement of gratitude. You see it in, in verse 2, we give thanks to God always, and it is that gratitude that really governs everything that Paul says in this chapter. And it's a kind of gratitude where he's not just thankful for these people and the personal relationship he might enjoy with them. It is a gratitude that is centered squarely in God. It's rooted in God himself and the active work that God is doing among them. And he even cultivates that gratitude. We've been seeing that. He cultivates the, grat the gratitude that he has in his heart for these people through intentional intercession as we looked at in verse 2. He's making mention of you in prayers. He cultivates that gratitude through intentional reflection. And verse 3, where he's bearing in mind, he's bringing to his remembrance in a very intentional way the work of faith, the labor of love, the steadfastness of hope. And then we looked at another way in which he cultivated that gratitude in verse 4, its intentional comprehension. And that we, we began looking at very carefully in verse 4, where he makes this profound statement, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. He intentionally thinks back to his original encounter with this congregation, and he says, I know that God has chosen you, and that's why I'm grateful to God for you. And we, we began looking at that a few weeks ago, and even last week we began to unpack it to say, just exactly how is it that the Apostle Paul could know this? Yes, indeed, God does choose. That's a biblical fact. How could you know that? Well, that's really what verses 5 through 10 express. Here are the evidences that Paul relies upon to know that God himself has chosen you for salvation. So what is it that convincingly shows God's choice and secures our gratitude to God in salvation? Well, as Paul does here, he goes back to the original encounter that he had with them, the encounter that we looked at previously in Acts chapter 17, he looks at their conversion and based on what happened and how they turned to God, he was confident about God's choosing them. So what is it that convincingly shows the choice of God? What is involved in true gospel ministry that would be specific evidence of God's sovereign choice? We've been looking at two evidences of God's choice. We looked at one last week. We'll look at the other this morning. Two evidences of God's sovereign choice that breeds a deep, constant spiritual gratitude. That's what we're looking at. Last week, we looked at the first one. The first evidence of God's choice that breeds gratitude is found in verses 4 and 5, and we called it spiritually powerful proclamation spiritually powerful proclamation. It's what we talked through last week. 
It's what Paul thinks about when he thinks about how he preached the gospel to them. How did the gospel come to them? It came to them in a spiritually powerful proclamation. He is confident of their election because he was confident of God's power in his own preaching of the gospel to them. They had the right message and it was displayed to them in a powerful way. And we looked at that. What made it powerful proclamation? Well, there was scriptural exposition. He was preaching the word, but it was more than that. It was not just word only. It also had spiritual power. It came with an ability that flows from the Holy Spirit in absolute confidence in the preacher, in the truthfulness and the power of that message. It also came with personal integrity because Paul makes appeal to them. You know what kind of people we have proven to be among you. You know it. You heard the word, you saw the expression of the power of the Spirit, and you have seen a life that is in concert with that message. That is powerful proclamation, spiritually powerful proclamation. Now, before I move on from that, there's one other thing I I wanted to say last week and I just didn't have time to say. Uh, I'm just going to throw it in this week. I just cut and paste it from the notes last week. So I'll try to be brief with it. Because I I know this could come up. I know that we, we want to think through this carefully. When Paul says, especially in that that latter part of verse five, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. We want to be careful with that statement. Paul is not saying here that election is sure only where good preachers preaching good truth are found. Think about this. Preachers with ungodly and inconsistent character can say true things and God can save contrary to the spiritual integrity of the preacher. Ultimately, It's not the life of the preacher, it's the truth of the gospel that saves, right? I mean, I think about someone like Martin Luther. How did he become a Christian? He was hearing the wrong gospel from corrupt people and still became a Christian. But I don't normally recommend people come to Christ through Catholicism, right? That's not the tool that you would recommend. God can do what God will do with his word as he sees fit. Furthermore, confidence about election is not guaranteed just because you were exposed to the right message from a great preacher. If you had a preacher who lived according to the scripture, preached the right message, that does not, my friends, guarantee that you're elect. It doesn't guarantee that. Just because you hear the right message doesn't mean that you will respond in the right way. Paul's point is is really not to say, well, you're elect because I, I preach the right message to you. No, he's, he's reflecting back on what evidence was actually there when they were converted. And he looks back and he says, I, I was there and I know what the Spirit was doing through this message. That's just one of the planks of evidence. I know that God's activity was there because I know his activity was in me as the preacher. Preaching the right message in the right way. You saw the fruit of it. But it also involves a second in evidence. Being sure of the election of God is is not just a spiritually, come from a spiritually powerful proclamation. There's a second necessary evidence. And that second necessary evidence is found in verses 6 through 10. It's a spiritually obvious transformation. Now, if if you were present and you saw and you heard and you were there when the right message, where the right man lived in the right way was preached and you saw the work of the Spirit, you saw that, and you watched spiritually powerful, obvious transformation take place among the people, that is the activity of God. It is unmistakable. That is a sign that that you are a part of God's choice. That's a profound statement. Is there a clear, unmistakable activity of God, not just in the preacher, but in those who hear the spiritually powerful preaching? If verse 5 is how the gospel came to them, verses 6 through 10 is how they came to the gospel. 
But what is it that makes up such spiritually obvious transformation? I mean, you heard the text read, and it it seems very clear, but let's unpack that. What makes up for real spiritual transformation, a transformation that's obvious? And obviously, we're going to think about that in light of our own lives and our own participation in the gospel. Do you see these things in your life? Do you see this kind of transformation in your heart working its way out into your actions? You can know the choice of God as you watch and they unfold the choices of others. Have you ever thought through that? You can know the choice of God as you see people's persistent choices. And again, as we have said before, our choices don't determine God's choice, but they can reveal His election. Do our sinful choices then, someone might come back and ask, do our sinful choices reveal that He's not elected us? Well, the reality is, in the Scripture, there's no way to know that until the end. There's no way to know that until the end. Then it will be obvious whether a person's willful choices receive the just judgment of God or whether their choices in life show the election of God. That isn't what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about when you do see people persistently choosing to follow Christ in their life and completely aligning their life to His, you are actually seeing evidence of God's election. Our persistent choices of righteousness actually reveal God's eternal election of salvation. So what is the evidence of a spiritually obvious transformation that would demonstrate God's choice? Let's look at four different elements today that comprise a spiritually obvious transformation. Just four different elements that comprise a spiritually obvious transformation. These are really interesting to me. You, you would think, ah, these don't sound perhaps obvious to me. They're not necessarily the go-tos that I would point out, but they're really rich as you think them through. Verse 6 is the first element, and I call it a persevering imitation. A persevering imitation. Just the first part of verse 6, you also became imitators of us, And of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation. I want you to think about this. Imitation is Christianity. Imitating Jesus is Christianity. When you become a Christian, you are taking on the name of Jesus. You are taking on the name of Jesus so that you now represent him to others. In fact, our church, every true local church, could rightly be called the body of Christ because the church actually represents the Savior. When you call yourself a Christian, what does that mean? When the disciples, in the book of Acts, when it says the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, what, what does that mean? That those who were following Jesus were first called Christians. Well, Christians is just a, a term that means a little Christ. What does that mean? Who are you representing in your life? You are a representative of Christ. Now, that should not be news to any of you who've studied your Bible carefully. If you go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and you see the creation of humanity, what is unique about humanity that's unlike anything else in the created world? Genesis 1, 26 through 27. When he created man and woman, he created them in what? The image of God. The whole point and purpose of humanity was to demonstrate the character and likeness of God in the earth as they lived their life. That's not new to us. That's the purpose of humanity. What happened in the fall? Well, we no longer accurately and fully display the complete image of God as we were created to do. So then, what is the point of salvation in the first place? What is the very point of your salvation? Well, Colossians 1, 15 tells us that Jesus actually is the image of God. God. 
If you want to find the fullest expression of what the image of God looks like in completion and perfection, you look at the person of Jesus Christ. But in Colossians 3.10, just jot that down. Listen to this carefully. Just jot down Colossians 3.10 because it tells us here's what's happening in your salvation. In salvation through Jesus, we have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. What is salvation? It is putting on the new self, being renewed to that original image as God first designed us to be, to fully image God. So what is Christianity in in its purest essence? It's imaging God's Son, who is the perfect image of God, living like the people He created us to be. Christian discipleship, then, is growing in imitating God. That's why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, there's a problem that comes with that. Think about us today. How far removed are we from when Jesus actually walked on this earth? I just, I don't think any of you are that old. Just looking around, maybe one or two, but uh, no, none of you are that old. Nobody, nobody has walked this earth and seen the Lord. I mean, could you imagine what it was to actually see the Lord and you're beholding the very complete image of God? So then, if we're supposed to image him, how do we know what that looks like? How do we do it in detail? How do we know what that looks like practically for us today, in our world, in our society? You imitate those who follow him. You imitate those who follow him. If they're following him, they will look like him. If you imitate them as they follow him, you will then image him. Isn't that what Paul said regularly to people? Follow my example. Now, you think about that. Follow your example. How arrogant is that? Follow your example? Yes, Paul actually said it. 1 Corinthians 4.16, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. As if that is the fundamental expression of Christian discipleship. Imitate me. And Paul said that, and he would go on in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me, of me just as I am also of Christ. Philippians three seventeen, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Follow our example. Philippians 4, 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. One commentator noted that of all of Paul's letters, the only book that does not mention the need for imitation is the book of Romans. All of his letters emphasize this idea. Now, I want you to look carefully at what is being said here of the Thessalonians In verse 6, they became, what? Imitators. They mimicked. That's uh, uh, imitate, mimic. Mimic is a take from the Greek word mimetes. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. Do you see that? You became imitators of us. Now, how could they do that? Well, this is based off of, it comes off of that last phrase in verse 5. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You know what kind of people we were, and so you began to imitate us. You saw the gospel in us. We displayed the gospel to you, and you imitated that. You became imitators. As they received the gospel message from Paul and his compatriots there, his gospel associates, they literally became, it's a passive tense, they became, they were made to be imitators. They entered into Christian discipleship. They became imitators. I mean, the only example they had of what a Christian should be and what it meant to look like Christ was Paul and Timothy and Silas. That's it. 
How did they know? They'd never met a Christian before. The gospel had never come to the city before. Paul brings the gospel for the first time. How do you know what a Christian is? Paul displayed it with his life, living with them day and night, night and day, day, so that they knew everything. And they begin to imitate. So as they received the word, they imitated Paul. That's Christianity. That's Christianity. I mean, why, why are you meeting in small groups and you call it discipleship? What do, you, what do you think you're doing? What are you attempting to do? Well, we read a book and we pray together and we help each other. We get vulnerable. Well, listen, friends, if you go to a discipleship group and you get vulnerable and you share your sins and that's as far as it goes, you've got nothing more than a secular help, self-help group. And you're trying to tag Bible verses onto it. That's not why we go to small groups. That's not why we meet in discipleship. That's not why we pray with each other. That's not, we do this so that our lives are conformed to the image of Christ so that we can help people imitate the Lord. That's the goal of our intentional discipling ministries. That's why we're preaching this morning, to call us to imitate the Lord. And that's why we're all here and we commit in membership to each other so we can reflect the Lord to one another. And we would actually want the world to look into us and see what's going on here and imitate what they see of Christ here. It's not just about the show for Sunday. It's about the life of the congregation. The life of the congregation that can be and should be imitated. That is Christianity. You know, what you need to do is you need to find the people who are most tenaciously following Christ, most biblically driven to follow the example of the Lord, and you spend inordinate amounts of time with them. Bother them. Invite yourself over. You, you can't all fit in our house. Uh, <laughs> worm your way into each other's lives. <clears throat> don't think, well, it's too forward. I don't want to get too open. I don't want to, I don't want to bother. No, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is who we are. I think that reveals how, how essential, significant Christian relationships are. I mean, you think about it. If you're, if you're going to come to a church and you're just going to have small surface kinds of relationships, limited fellowship, hit and miss interaction, that does not lead to imitation. That is not going to lead you to Christian discipleship. That's not going to help your soul. If you just show up on Sunday morning and that's your Christian life, what a waste. What a waste. You won't imitate anyone profoundly that way. You won't imitate the Lord that way. I mean, you think about Christian friendship. I want deep Christian friendship. What is deep Christian friendship? It is a friendship that leads you to look more like Christ. That you can imitate one another's life to the degree that you're actually imitating the Lord. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. As we reflected the Lord, you followed that example. That's what you did, he says, when you received the word. Now, I want you to notice something else in verse 6. You received the word, you became imitators as you received the word, and you received the word in much tribulation. In much tribulation. This is so fascinating. This is a word that refers to afflictions. Some commentators would suggest the word was used to to paint the picture in your mind of someone pressing grapes, squeezing the grape, bursting the grape. Affliction is the pressure, the tribulation. It is suffering. Now, Paul would tell them later in 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, that he'd already told them that such afflictions would come, that he was going to suffer affliction. That is not news to them. They shouldn't be bothered by that. Affliction comes with the territory. Suffering comes with the territory of Christianity. Paul would regularly warn the disciples of that oncoming affliction. 
suffering. Acts 14, 22, he was strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, afflictions, same word, we must enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations, we'll come to the kingdom of God. In fact, I, I think this is what Paul means in this interesting verse in Colossians 1:24. Just jot that down. It's one to meditate on and think about carefully later, but in Colossians 1.24, I want you to listen to it. Paul makes this very interesting statement. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I rejoice in my afflictions, my tribulations that are there for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church. This is fascinating. My sufferings physically in this life are for your sake, and I'm doing my part on behalf of the church. And what is that? What is that part? In filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. What? Now, if you want to talk about arrogance, that could be the epitome of an arrogant statement. Ah, I am making up where Jesus' afflictions were deficient. Oh, really? Exactly. How many of the people in the city of Colossae had ever seen Jesus? No one. He's not saying there's something deficient in what Jesus did on the cross or in his afflictions. That's not what he's saying. What's deficient is your personal experience of them. So my suffering is the display of the suffering of the Lord so that you can see what it was like, so you can follow the gospel example. Do you ever think of your suffering in those terms? How do people know how practically to follow the Lord and what it looks like to be a Christian in the midst of suffering if Jesus is not physically here to show us what that looks like? He does it through his people. He does it through the body of Christ, the church. That's a profound thought. In a society that prizes individualism, personal autonomy, we're always championing the freedom to be yourself, a lust to publicly celebrate personal, personally defined identity. This kind of imitation of someone else, that's completely countercultural. We don't live in a world that says imitate someone else. We live in a world that says be your own identity. Let me tell you what will damn you. Be your own identity. What will leave you empty, fruitless, discouraged, despondent, lost in sin is to be like yourself. You must be like Christ. And we are here to demonstrate what that is like. Does that not put a weight of responsibility on our shoulders of how we interact with one another and care for each other and live with each other and pray with one another and help one another through sin? That's what our world needs to see. If you're devoted to your identity to reflect the image of Jesus, then that is Christianity. And listen to this, affliction is what will test that devotion. Perseverance is the Christian response to the test of your devotion to imitate Christ. You persevere through the affliction, trusting in the Lord, seeing his vision of life. Perseverance says, no, I'm not going to give in to the, the the, the ways of society that are trying to crush me and remove me. No, I'm, I'm going to persevere to look like the Lord. I'm going to submerge my identity in that of Jesus because I think identifying with Jesus, no matter how much affliction may come, is more valuable. That's more valuable than giving up that identity and looking like the rest of the world. I mean, you think about our sufferings, and dear friends, our sufferings can be intense and massive 
and painful and mind-boggling. They can be consuming. But when you put that on the timeline of eternity, your life of affliction is but a little tiny blip. How valuable then is it to image Christ and to imitate that as we see it reflected in others. Now, if you saw that, that kind of imitation of those who look like Christ, you would not look at that and say, oh, that seems natural. No, that's supernatural. That is an evidence, that's an evidence of an obviously transformed life, isn't it? A spiritually transformed life. Let's look at a second element of a a spiritually obvious transformation. It's not just this imitation, that idea of imitation, but secondly, it's at the end of verse 6. It is a spiritual joy, a spiritual joy. They became imitators. They persevered in imitating amidst affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that at the end of verse 6? With the joy of of the Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual joy. It is a joy that comes from, that is sourced from, that comes out of the presence of the Spirit in your life. You imitated us and the Lord as you received the word in extreme affliction, and we, and what preserved you in that kind of persevering imitation was actually the joy of the Holy Spirit, a Spirit-produced joy. That's what gets you through affliction, by the way, is the joy of the Holy Spirit. So it's worth asking the question, we'll, we'll have to unpack this even further later in the book when he comes back to it again, but how do you know that your joy is actually a Spirit-produced joy? How do you know that your joy, your happiness, is wrought by the Spirit of God? It likely is a spiritual joy when you possess a joy in God when there is no natural reason to be satisfied with your circumstances. When there's no natural reason to be content, you are satisfied in God. That's a spiritual joy. It is a joy that comes from the Holy Spirit because it is a joy that is actually connected to what represents the Holy Spirit, not what's contrary to him. Similar to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says that love does not rejoice in error. Love rejoices with the truth. The Spirit, if you possess the Spirit, is a joy that finds joy in what represents the Spirit, not what is contrary to him. If you find your joys rest in what is contrary to the Spirit, that's not, that's not coming from the Spirit. When your joy is in the truth of God and the things that represent the Spirit of God, that's in line with the joy that comes from the Spirit. It is a joy that comes from the Holy Spirit when it is a joy that shows the evidence of the presence of the Spirit in your life. It's a recognition I am never left to myself. The Spirit is constantly present with me. It is a joy that reflects the Scriptures that are actually penned by the Spirit. You want the joy of the Holy Spirit? Are you living according to the Spirit's Word, what He's given us in the Scriptures? Do you find joy in your heart when you engage with the the Scriptures? So I, I see this joy of the Holy Spirit being a satisfied surrender to the purposes of God. That gives a person spiritual joy even in the midst of the worst possible circumstances or the mo- most intense fires of affliction you could imagine. A satisfied surrender to the purposes of God. That doesn't mean that this kind of spiritual joy is going to be reflected in just constant personal giddiness. It's not merely happiness. It's not always shown in laughter. Paul said, always sorrowful and always rejoicing. It's not expressed through ecstatic excitability. I hear that all the time. 
oh, just look, just sense the buzz and the excitability of all these people. That, that shows that God's at work among us. Let me tell you what would really show that God is at work among us is if we're weeping over the, the state of our world and yet we're satisfied that God is in control. There's a satisfaction, a happiness because we see, I don't know what's gonna happen. I mourn over the sin in the world, but I see him moving the pieces on the planet to be exactly where he wants it to be before he brings the fullness of his kingdom to the earth. That, that's the joy of the Holy Spirit. And you can, you can weep through that. And it might have moments of laughter and excitability. There might be giddiness in that at times, but that's not what defines the joy of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual joy is a deep, settled satisfaction in God within your life. You see God in his providence. You remember we talked about God's providence so much this past summer. And providence being that idea that God is govern, governing all things to his glory. That's providence. When, when you have this deep, settled satisfaction that God's providence is governing everything, and you're settled, you're at rest, you're satisfied because of that control of God. It's what Paul says in Romans chapter 5 is a demonstration of the work of the gospel. Paul says in Romans 5, 3, we also exult, exult. We, we have joy. We have an exaltation in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character, proven character, hope, and hope never disappoints because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit is given, and what does that cause us to do? Exult in our tribulations because we know what God is going to accomplish through them. We're satisfied in that. That's how Paul could speak of being sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, overflowing with joy in our affliction. That's how he could say of himself he was being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, and I rejoice and share my joy with you all in that. And yet, knowing that that's a settled fact, that if you're in Christ, you have the joy of the Holy Spirit, it's still something you have to cultivate, right? You have to cultivate it. That's why James would say in James 1, 2, you have to consider it all joy. You have to think about it in terms, you have to cultivate it when you encounter various trials. Even Peter called us to cultivate this joy through seeing our life Ultimately, as 1 Peter 1.5 says, protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this, in God protecting us, in God preserving us, in this you greatly rejoice. You don't rejoice in sin. You don't rejoice in what's going on that's contrary to God in our world. You rejoice that God protects you by his power in salvation. And in this you greatly rejoice. Paul will tell these Christians later in the book of 1 Thessalonians, you've got to cultivate it. You have to rejoice always. How do you rejoice always? Well, you don't unless you have a restful, satisfied sense that the providence of God governs it all to his glory and for our ultimate good. That's the joy of the Holy Spirit. It's coming up to the fruit of temptation. Where you look at it and you say, this will make me wise to determine good and evil for myself. This, this will make me satisfied. And you look at the fruit of temptation and you say, the joy that I get from that, no, that's, that's the passing pleasure of sin. The joy I get from that, no, that, that's the cotton candy of life. Instead, you say, God is the one who knows good and evil, and I will hide myself in his purposes whether I understand them all or not, I will hide myself in that because I believe there's greater satisfaction in God than in the fruit of temptation that's in front of me. That's the joy of the Holy Spirit. 
if you saw a people imitating those who imitate Christ in the midst of severe affliction with an ever satisfied sense of satisfaction in God in that affliction, would you say, oh, that, that's normal? That's normal. That's natural. No, it's not. It's supernatural. It's the work of the gospel. You'd say that is God's activity. And that's how you could look at someone and say, oh, I know the election of God because look at what we're seeing in their responses. There's a third, there's a third element that comprises a spiritually obvious transformation. It's found in verses seven through nine. I describe it as an example to imitate. This is the flip side of the first one. This is here an example to imitate. This is how the discipleship of the Thessalonians actually became and came about. If they imitated Paul and Paul's example of the Lord, what was the result of that? Verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. What did they become an example of? You became an example of us and of the Lord, the ones you were imitating. You became an example to others of what it looks like to be a Christian, persevering in affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And you did that in Macedonia and Achaia. Why does he mention these areas? Well, Thessalonica was the capital city of the region of Macedonia, which is the northern part of the Grecian peninsula today. They were the capital city, so they would have had a particular influence that would radiate throughout that entire area. If you saw a secular people actually imitating the Lord and receiving affliction for it, and they have a settled sense of satisfaction and joy in the Holy Spirit, that kind of testimony becomes an exemplary testimony. It's one that spreads all through an area, and people hear of that, and they see it, and they want to be like that. Achaia, the southern portion of the Grecian peninsula from which the cities of Athens and Corinth would be a part of, major cities in that southern region, their testimony was stretching even down there. And, and you know how that would be because you remember what we learned in Acts chapter 17. Paul was chased out of the Thessalonian city, went down to Berea south, a couple of days south as far as if you were trying to walk that journey. And the Thessalonians who hated Paul heard that he was preaching to the Bereans, so he went down the, they went down there and they ran him out of that city and he went even further south into Athens. He started preaching the gospel in Athens. And you remember, the result of the preaching of the gospel in Athens was not as profound as it was perhaps in Thessalonica. Only a few people began to follow the Lord and he left Athens, establishing no church there that we know of, and he went down to Corinth. Corinth had never had a Christian testimony in it before that we know of, and he began to preach the gospel there. And a church was established, and he spent some time there. So as Paul was moving south after preaching the gospel, it is fascinating to hear what he experienced personally in relationship to the testimony of the Thessalonians as he left their city. You see it in verse 8? For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. It's like a pulsating sound moving out from Thessalonica. Sound waves are, are piercing through each city. The word of the Lord, the gospel of Christ has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Your faith toward God has gone forth so that, this is really profound, we have no need to say anything. Why don't you have to say anything about the, the work that God did in Thessalonica? As you go to Berea and Athens and Corinth, Paul, why don't you have to say anything because of the beginning of verse 9? Because they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you. Now that's profound, isn't it? Yeah. Now we have no, no evidence that the Thessalonians were sending missionaries out to all these cities ahead of Paul. I mean, Paul is literally running for his life. But the testimony of conversion and the spiritually obvious transformation of their life was so fast running, so profound that it was getting ahead of Paul before he made it to each one of these cities. He gets there and they said, yeah, we already know what happened with you. We already know about their example. 
We're already following that example. That would make missions much easier, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? Maybe that says what kind of churches we should be and what kind of people we should be in society so that the testimony of the gospel in us would run so fast that by the time that the angels reach South Asia, they've already heard about the work of the gospel in us. That would be profound, wouldn't it? Would you doubt whether or not God was active if you saw that kind of example? No, that's the evidence of election, isn't it? That's how Paul could say, oh, I know God has chosen you. I see what you're imitating. I see the joy of the Holy Spirit, spiritual joy. I see this kind of example in others because of you. It's really, really profound. One more, one last element of spiritually obvious transformation. It's in verses 9 and 10. It is simply this, a God-centered life. Here's where we get to the content of that transformation. Here's the content of it. It's a God-centered life. That's just the most simple way, I think, to sum up what we read in verses 9 and 10. They themselves report about us, what kind of reception we had with you, and what kind of reception was that? How you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. That's a God-centered life. Here's the content of their testimony, a life that is comprehensively centered on the one true God. And it's very easy to see the two components of that. What does a a God-centered life consist of? Very simple. Verse 9, you live to serve God. God. You live to serve God. The purpose of your life is to serve God. You turned to God from idols to serve. There's the purpose, to serve a living and true God. In fact, I would say this might be a comprehensive definition of repentance. If you think about it, You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's a comprehensive definition of repentance. To turn from sin to God in order to live for him. That's what repentance is. Repentance is not merely stopping what is sinful. It's beginning what is righteous also. It consists of you starting to live your life in a particular way with God at the very center of it. You turn to God from idols. That means that they had an immediate recognition of their worship problem, which is at the heart of all of us. Again, I go back and I I think of the image of Eve standing in front of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil about to take that. She had not just a selfish problem, but a worship problem, didn't she? She wanted what would make her God. I don't have to be dependent on God anymore for good and evil. I can do it on my own. I can be autonomous. It's a worship problem. The idol was the fruit that could make, give her what she really wanted, which was self-promotion and self-exaltation. That's really the struggle. Idols all the little idols of the world, and we can talk about trying to find the idols of our heart. There's really one major idol of all of our hearts, and that is we want to be at the center of everything. We really want personal self-satisfaction. We think we know better. That's the truest idol that must be repented of. We live for our own supremacy what we want, what we desire, what we long for, what we crave, what we lust after. We want a particular identity from others, a feeling. We want acceptance. We want approval, enjoyment. The pursuit of our supremacy makes us bow down to created things that we assume will give us what will exalt us. The material possessions that we play around with, we think that's going to give us the identity that we want in front of others. 
The educational achievements that we go after will give us the approval that we desperately crave in front of other people. The relationships that we are desirous of, oh, that will give us the acceptance that we demand for ourselves. The physical appearance that we're preoccupied with, oh, that will give us the acclaim and the feeling of achievement that we feel we have to have. Those are the idols. And everyone has them. Everyone. Everyone. That those idols and our pursuit shows where we're not living for God, right? Because repentance then is a recognition of who God is and what is not God. It's a recognition of what we are lusting and craving for that is contrary to the one true living God as we're pursuing dead and false idols. And beloved, any true turning to God requires a turning away from idols. You cannot have them both. You cannot keep them. You cannot play with them. You cannot entertain them. You cannot cultivate those idols. They will destroy you. And God knows it. That's why he won't let you do that in conversion and repentance. You have to turn to him. Now, I want you to focus on that phrase. You you turned away from the idols. You turned to God from the idols for what purpose? To serve. To serve. That is the word for slavery. Slavery. You turned from the idols to God to be enslaved to God, to serve him as if you were a slave. You abandoned your own design for life. You approached life as if you were at the center. And you said, no, I have to live as if God is at the center. That means living as if the only will in the universe that really matters is God's, not mine. My identity is not my own. My identity is lost. I'm only thought of as belonging to God. My joy is not found in doing my will. It's doing his. That's enslavement. Your happiness is to serve wherever he sends. When he sends you there. With the tools that he provides you. And you serve as his slave at his will. As long as he designs, because you belong to him. You turn to God from all those idolatrous identities to do one thing for one reason. That is to serve as if you were a slave to God. Now listen, for people in the first century world to think of that, there's nothing more humiliating they could have ever imagined. Don't don't give yourself this idea that somehow slavery was a better thing then. Slavery was not as humiliating. No, nobody, nobody lived in the first century world says, I, I aspire to be a slave. In fact, you, you never got out of slavery more than likely unless there was just some unique, magnanimous individual who would let you go from it, but that was rare. Once you're born a slave, you're a slave. To say this to people, ah, to come to Christ is to be, to be enslaved to God. Really? I want that? I want to be a slave? No, no, what I want is freedom. I want freedom. I live my life to be enslaved to no man, to no person, to nothing. Then you can't have God. He's not going to share supremacy with you. He won't. Christians Christians are not looking to get rid of the shackles of slavery. We're looking to put them on. We're actually looking to keep them on. Slavery to God. You say, I I don't know that that's the best picture. I don't know that that's the way, Pastor Brett, most people are going to say, hey, that sounds attractive. How's that for attractional Christianity? Yeah, but think about what happens when you're enslaved to God. God. 
he becomes your father. You are his adopted children. You are treated as sons, firstborn sons who will inherit everything in the father's treasure. Not so bad, is it? To free yourself from slavery to the one true and living God is to enslave yourself to what will condemn you for eternity. No matter how freeing you may think it feels in the moment. To not be enslaved to God means you are in fact a slave to your sin. Conversion is to live your entire life in order to serve God. Your home is to serve God. Your employment is service to God. Your family is service to God. Your education is serving God. Your friendships are service to God. Your life is completely submerged in identifying with God for his purposes. The alternative is an enslavement that brings judgment. You live to serve God. I want you to see the second component of a God-centered life. This is really fascinating. It's not just to serve God. It is to wait for Jesus. To wait for Jesus. Serving God in the here and now is not an end in itself. It's an anticipation of something greater. Do you see it at the end, verse 10? You're not only turning to God from idols to serve him, but to wait for his son from heaven. You turn to God from idols to wait for his son. Do you ever think about that as part of your expression of the gospel? What it means to be a Christian is that you're now going to wait for his son to come back from heaven. That's a part of your Christianity. You live now for God actively serving him, but you live expectantly of Christ to come back to the earth from heaven. That is a profound motivation for life. That's how you read the newspaper as if Jesus is coming back. That would help us, wouldn't it? You say, well, I don't read the newspaper. That's how you watch Fox News. You need, you need more Jesus than Fox News. You need to listen as if he's coming back, not as if anything that you're seeing and listening to actually matters ultimately. Live as if he's coming back. Ah, this is all preparatory. This is all him setting things up. This is all him preparing. Now, now be careful with that. Don't go write fictional novels about all this, of how it's going to all work out in the end. Live like he's coming. Think about all of life as if he's coming. What kind of motivation will that be for you in dealing with your sin as if he could come? You're waiting for him to come from heaven. We'll have much more to say about this as we go through. But if you lived all of your Christian life as if Jesus would come back, you would not look at porn as much as you do. You would not live a secretive life. It will drive you to be reconciled in your wrecked relationships with people and let go of your selfishness that you were holding on to that keeps you from being at peace with people. He's coming. It will provide encouragement for people who are in despair of what they see and don't have, but he's coming. It gives an elevated purpose to all the mundane things in life. You're bored? It's all preparatory. He's coming. This is the Jesus whom God raised from the dead. So he's in heaven because God raised him from the dead. He's overcome the greatest enemy of our life, which was death. The ultimate consequence of sin was death. God raised him from the dead, conquered that, and put him in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, where he's ruling over everything now and moving it exactly where he wants it. So he comes. So he comes. And I want you to see that last phrase because it's really important. This is the Jesus who was not only raised by God from the dead, but who rescues us from the wrath to come. There's a number of expressions of God's wrath in the Bible. There's a description of his current wrath, Romans 1.18, where the wrath of God is being expressed now in the sons of disobedience. It's here 
It's revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. We can see the wrath of God. Romans 1, in a current expression, shows us that. There are other expressions of the wrath of God, like you'll find in something like Revelation chapter 11, where it describes a period of time before the resurrection of the dead and the reward of the saints. There is a period of wrath. You can call that whatever you want, eschatological wrath, tribulational wrath. But I think what he has in mind here is not either of those. It is eternal wrath. It is the wrath that God brings through his son when he comes back to the earth. Revelation 14, another angel, a third one followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in the full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. It's eternal wrath. It's likely what Paul is referring to. When he comes back to the earth, there will be an expression of eternal wrath. That would tell the Thessalonians the affliction you're experiencing right now is not that wrath. He's coming. It is a wrath that is still to come when he comes from heaven. Now, what I want you to see is is the word rescue, present tense, meaning he is rescuing. He is constantly rescuing you from the eternal wrath that is coming. This should give you hope. What if I fall into sin? Will I be lost to the wrath of God? He is rescuing you from the coming wrath. In other words, this is what we often sing about. He will hold me fast. He is right now through the church, discipleship, obedience, repentance. He is rescuing you from the coming wrath. You fall into sin, you turn from sin. He is rescuing you from the coming wrath. That is what Jesus is doing. Now, listen, friends, this is a kind of life, if you looked at that kind of life and that kind of obvious transformation, you would say, that is the activity of God. You would say, I know God has chosen you. I see what you've heard in the gospel. I see the power it was expressed in when it was preached. I see the life that was lived that you now imitate. You have a joy that comes from the Holy Spirit despite the affliction so that you've become an example to other people. And you live your life as if God were at the center of it. Every moment of your life, God is at the center. Expecting Christ to come, living as if to serve him. That's spiritual transformation. Is that you? Now listen, not every Christian is going to have the the greatest expression or publicity like perhaps these did, but do you even see any level of transformation? Do you? Do you long for that? I hope you do. Or at least I pray that you will consider how valuable Christ is, how worthy he is, so that you would live your life with him at the very center to imitate him. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that we would we would be able to display this kind of life of transform this kind of life of grace and mercy from your hand that displays your sovereign hand of election so that the world would see the hand of God is on these people. The hand of God is on this family in this life. I pray it would become clear. I pray that we would be a people who turn from sin and our idols to serve you, to see the value of you in all of life, to have the actual joy of the Holy Spirit pervading everything that we do and who we are. Be honored, Lord, among us. Bring transformation. Those who are in this room, we pray, Father, for those in this room who do not yet know you, have not turned from their sin.
to serve you. Arrest their hearts, convince their conscience, bend their will. May they come to you humbly, desirous of Christ, turning from their sin. Oh, how I pray that this transformation would be the testimony of our congregation. You're going to disperse us from this place into the various neighborhoods and places of work and schools where we find ourselves throughout the week. May we show this kind of transformation. The world is desperate to see it, Lord. May they see it in us for your glory through your Son in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you.